Tonight on a special edition of E-Talk, Hugh Dillon's Road to Success. Actor, musician, tough guy. We're not here to hurt anyone. From being arrested by cops to playing a cop on TV, the Flashpoint star on why he just had to be a part of the show. I read that script and I thought this is exceptional. The actor candid like never before. Then Dylan's story, not widely known. And I just realized I can't do it because the next time I'm going to die. Opening up about his past with drug abuse, his private struggle to beat addiction. I got in over my head and it just went from bad to worse. The lowest point and who helped him get back on track. It's hellish. And I was not an easy addict either. <laughs> the incredible journey from his days as a rock and roll outlaw. And why Hughes at the top of his game with not one, but two hit primetime shows and his first solo album. They offered me a deal I couldn't refuse. <laughs> Plus, a rocker at heart, Hughes' favorite tunes revealed. You know, I can be at a traffic light, freaking out on somebody who's cut me off, and all of a sudden, hey, it's uh, Snowbird, Ann Murray. And how music continues to be a defining light in his life. I've been so blessed, and I'm just so grateful I have this, this life. From our E-Talk studio and headquarters in the heart of downtown Toronto. Tonight, we turn the spotlight on Flashpoint star Hugh Dillon. E-Talk begins right now. Works well with others. Your yes. first solo music project. How long have you been waiting to record this? I had a, a collection of songs that I recorded with a friend of mine named Chris Osti, and Paul Wangwa from The Hip heard them and was interested in how they were good songs and produced the record. The Tragically Hip's guitarists, Paul and Rob, lend their talents to Hugh's new disc. I read that you guys recorded at uh, in their studio, the Hip's studio. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. The so, Bathhouse in Kingston. The yeah. Bathhouse. What can fans expect from the album? I see it in her eyes. She had to make me laugh before she made me cry. She it's very intense in terms of, of making these uh, honest little rock and roll songs. You know, there's not a whole lot of effects or delay or, or things. Yeah that are associated Clean. with classic rock. We started getting together on Saturday, and hey, wow, we got a whole song. And then Tuesday, and we got two songs. And you get, you hit this chemistry with people sometimes. And so we started racking them up because there was, I think, again, there was just, it was just so easy to do because there was no reason to do it. We weren't trying to make a record. We weren't trying to write for the stage, or we weren't trying to make, uh, it was just, we're songwriters. And I think that's why it, um, it worked. It's the first release in four years from the former frontman of the Headstones, and he draws from a wide variety of musical influences. Rough Trade, BTO, The Hip, you know, Metric's got some great stuff. Uh, it goes on and on. But what's funny is just, you know, I can be at a traffic light, freaking out on somebody who's cut me <laughs> off, and all of a sudden, hey, it's uh, Snowbird, Ann Murray. Oh my God! <laughs> you know what I mean? That's nice. Like there are certain, and certain artists that you, that have that, that timeless effect on you. And that effect started early for Dylan. My brothers and sisters are a lot older than me, and so growing up, they all had the records, and I was listening to um, Riders on the Storm when I was six. Wow. You know, smoking cigarettes, and well, they were, not smoking cigarettes when you were six. I remember I, nice. had my, I know I had my, my first pop. Oh, your Popeye cigarette? No, I had pop because my sisters and brother were like Dude. 17 or 18, and I was just mouthy, and they said, okay, have one. You know, and I coughed mine. Fast forward a few years, and the musical calling was too strong to resist. You know, I was growing up in Kingston, and, uh, you know, my folks had sent me to a private school for a year to kind of straighten up, and it didn't work, and I came back to Kingston, I had a motorcycle, and I just loved rock and roll music, and Gord Downey and I would go to this club called the Prince George, and they had these old blues guys playing, huh. and uh, all the, the guys in the hip, and myself, and David Usher, and a whole bunch of people oh had, all went to the same school at the same time. And so I was into kind of authentic rock and roll. And you know, we were, we, one night we were at, um, smoking an herbal cigarette with, with uh, Luther Guitar Johnson, who was Muddy Waters' guitar player. And Very that guy cool. was 70 years old, and he was still on the road, and I was fascinated. Hmm. And uh, you know, he took the time to talk to me, and then I went back the next night, and you know, he was talking to me and Gord, and we were wow. 18. And I just was fascinated with these old blues guys. And of course, you know, the Rolling Stones and the whole blues. I like people who told real stories because yeah. then I wanted to, when 
I got around to it to write songs myself. I wanted to tell honest stories with some things that I knew about. And he did. Dylan went on to become the lead singer of hard rock band The Headstones, one of Canada's most commercially successful bands of the 90s. But with the rock and roll life came the rock and roll lifestyle. I got in over my head and, and um, yeah, it just went from bad to worse and you think that you've got a handle on it, you know, because I was just, it just got, I remember reading, you know, about Johnny Cash or, or any one of my old heroes about how, you know, you need uppers and downers or whatever, and I go, what's wrong with these guys, you know? But what you don't see is that if you could compress time, you'd yeah. get it. Yeah. But it's such odd little increments that everything seems okay. So how does one pull themselves out of that? You have got to want to. And if you're lucky enough, lucky enough to have people around you who love you and care about you, you've got a chance. But really, it's up to you. I had a lot of chances. 20 uh, detoxes, five rehabs, wow, really? hospitals, uh, got arrested, jail, court. Uh, you know, a lot of what should have been wake-up calls. We were out on the road and I relapsed and I just realized I can't do it because the next time I'm gonna die and that's not fair to my family or my wife. And uh, I just knew it, but um, I just knew that's what was gonna happen. You know, it's jails, institutions, or death. And I'd kind of been the other two I've already been to, and so I knew that there was no way out. Dylan credits the love of friends and family, especially his wife Midori, with saving his life. Oh, I wouldn't be here without them. I mean, I mean, my mom and dad, and my sisters, and and, uh, and Midori and her family. It's just, you know, I had given up on myself probably a year before I kind of pulled it together because I just thought I can't do it. You know, I've been to all these rehabs. I, I'm one of those guys who can't do it. And Midori never gave up, and my sisters and my folks never gave up, and it was, and it, it was hell. I mean, I'm just giving you the broad strokes and, right. and, and saying, yeah, and then this is what happened, but it was... You put them... You, uh... you, I put my family through hell, and anybody who has that addict in their lives, it's, it's hellish. And I was not an easy addict either. <laughs> really? And, uh, in what sense? Like... Just... The denial was so strong yeah. that it was everybody else's problem but mine, you know, until I really got to a point where I knew that I had to um, change. And, uh, you know, it's like a country and western song with Midori, I love you but you have to change. <laughs> Up next, from wild child to rock and roll outlaw, his volatile lifestyle and the turning point that changed everything. 